Hello, hello, wonderful friends. It's great to be with you today. Wonderful to be with you today. Session number 35. You have made it to 35. Uh, in this series, and uh, that means we're not so far off from 45, and soon we'll give you a heads up on what's coming next if you're going to stick with us. <laughs> but today we move to Isaiah Berlin. Wow, Isaiah Berlin. Very interesting stuff we're going to cover together today. Let's start with a little poll question relevant to Sir Isaiah. On truth, I find almost nothing to be absolutely true. I find some truth in almost everything. So which of those speaks to you a little bit more? I find almost nothing to be absolutely true, or I find some truth in almost everything. You might, maybe both resonate, maybe neither resonates, but which one of those resonates more for you? Wow, this is the first time we have ever had a 100% vote. <laughs> no one here voted uh, that I find almost nothing to be absolutely true. And 100% voted, I find some truth in almost everything. So um, <laughs> we should just uh, end this session now. Mashiach has come, the Messiah has come. We've resolved all of our issues. <laughs> we all agree on everything. So... <laughs> But actually, we're going to see there's a bunch of nuance even to that position. So friends, what does it mean to be truly free? Something we're going to discuss. And is it enough to be free from the impositions of tyrants and masters? Or do we need something more? Isaiah Berlin was born an Eastern European Jew and escaping persecution from the Russian Empire. He, Im he immigrated to Britain when he was 11. Ultimately, he ended up at Oxford and became a world-famous intellectual. Berlin was a descendant of leaders of Chabad, and he would refer to the Lubavitcher Rebbe as my cousin. We can see how breaking free of the Russian Empire as a child made Berlin's philosophical work particularly interested in freedom. Berlin's biggest idea, which he introduced in 1958 in his short work, Two Concepts of Liberty, was his distinction between negative and positive liberty. Negative liberty is freedom from external constraints or impositions, while positive liberty is the freedom to pursue what we believe to be good. We can trace the idea of negative liberty back to John Stuart Mill, but the contribution of Berlin is that it is not only freedom from oppression that matters, but also freedom to affirm what we want to affirm and pursue it. I hope that distinction makes sense to folks to flesh that out a little bit more, freedom from versus freedom to. For me, Berlin's distinction between negative and positive liberty is clearly demonstrated in the Jewish story through the connection between the exodus from Egypt and the receiving of the commandments at Mount Sinai. The Jewish people are achieving negative liberty when they are freed from enslavement in Egypt. No longer must their days be determined by what Pharaoh wants of them. But freedom from enslavement is not sufficient on its own. We are not fulfilled until we have the freedom to live according to a higher will and guidance for a just and holy life, right? So freedom from slavery, that's not enough. Freedom to affirm our moral and spiritual destiny. Um, so to today, we might ask ourselves, what am I working to be free from? And what am I what am I looking to affirm that freedom to ultimately long towards? By the way, I was just thinking this last week about how amazing it is that Moshe, Moses, speaks to the Jewish people with an Egyptian accent. You might think the person with an accent is a foreigner, right? 
the foreigner, they're kind of a little bit, you know, um, uh, you, not as respected. You know, the person who speaks in a heavy accent, right? You're not a real, really a part of our society. You're a little bit of an outsider, right? But Moshe was raised in the Egyptian palace, right? Grandson of Pharaoh. So when, so clearly when he spoke to the Israelites and spoke the word of God, he spoke not in the Hebrew they spoke. He spoke the Hebrew to them with an Egyptian accent. I mean, how interesting is that? That they were hearing a heavy Egyptian accent when they were accessing this, this word. They were hearing the voice of a foreign. Anyways, so too, we can see this distinction in the current state of Israel. On the one hand, a Jewish state enables Jews to be free from the marginalization of living as second-class citizens, as was the case in many parts of the world. But more importantly, it enables something even greater, which is the freedom for the Jewish people to actualize their own destiny. It's not enough to say this is a state that is uh, better than an Ashkenazi accent, right? <laughs> um, yeah, it's not enough to say this is a state that is there as a refuge from uh, persecution. It also needs to affirm some goals. So too with America. America can't just be a place of refuge for people fleeing persecution. That's a whole conversation around immigration policy today and refugee policy today. But it also has to be that America stands for something more than eat, drink, and be merry, right? What is the good life that America wants to affirm aside from anti-oppression? And how can we actually build that discourse? And I, sadly, the, 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 um, the, um, the social justice discourse is often very empty and that it only focuses on negative liberty, not positive liberty. It focuses on what we want to be free from, but it never actually affirms the good beyond the um, anti-oppression. And so how do we build that discourse alongside of it? Meanwhile, in America, the Bill of Rights is the defining political document that establishes negative liberty for all of America's citizens. The First Amendment, though it precedes Berlin's work, includes the Establishment Clause and the Free Exercise Clause. Together, these ensure the government cannot force a religion on the people, and individuals are free to practice the religion they want. And so Berlin's dual notion of freedom positioned him as a major advocate for the pluralism we support today. We know we cannot force our views on others, and we know others must be free to have their own beliefs, just as we are free to have ours. While in our time, we often take this for granted, it feels almost obvious, we should recognize that it's a massive departure from the, from the ki kind of political thought that was often dominant in the first half of the 20th century. Philosophers who came before Berlin tended to have grand unified theories, such as communism and fascism, which attempted to understand humanity's role in the history of the universe. This idea of positive and negative liberty sounds great, but there's a point at which the two can clash. It is often the case that a strong definition of positive liberty will often come into conflict with negative liberty. For example, when there is communism that tells people what the good life is to pursue, that articulation of positive liberty now tramples on the negative liberty. It's not sufficient for it simply to be proposed theoretically but not to be made real, people must conform to its dictates. This is where Berlin's pluralism comes in. He argues that modern politics must refrain from claiming the authority to define the good and impose it on others. Instead, every person must be free to figure out what is good themselves within reason so that the liberty of all can be upheld. This will be far from easy. Here's how Berlin writes in um, Here's, how, here's, here, here's Berlin's own words. True pluralism is much more tough-minded and intellectually bold. It rejects the view that all conflicts of values can be finally resolved by synthesis and that all desirable goals may be reconciled. It recognizes that human nature generates values which, though equally sacred, equally ultimate, exclude one another without there being any possibility of establishing an objective hierarchy hierarchical relation among them. Moral conduct may therefore involve making agonizing choices, 
without the help of universal criteria between incompatible but equally desirable values, right? So one might have said, go back to Hegel, that what we want to do is resolve all these conflicts. All these conflicts we have, we dream of a day where they're going to be resolved. Right? Now, of course, we want war to be gone. But the notion that, you know what? The Democrats are going to win or the Republicans are going to win and the other party's just going to be gone or everyone's going to become Christian or everyone's going to become Muslim. Right? We're all going to become one religion and affirm one truth. Right? Actually, right, these tensions are not going to go away. We don't even dream of them going away. Ideological tensions, value tensions are here to stay. And we embrace a pluralism that embraces the various dimensions of truth within each of them. That Orthodox Jews might wish Reform Judaism to just assimilate away, and Reform Judaism might wish Orthodox Judaism to just kind of fundamentalize itself away, but that's not going to happen. How can we find the truth in various approaches rather than just wish them away? Each of us will have to make really hard choices in value conflicts, and we'll have to feel the loss even when we make the best decision we can. Here's what Isaiah Berlin says. The notion of the perfect whole, the ultimate solution in which all good things coexist, seems to me not merely unobtainable, that is a truism, but conceptually incoherent. Some among the good, the great goods cannot live together. That, that is a conceptual truth. We are doomed to choose, and every choice may entail an irreparable law. Now, I love this point from Berlin, because what he's, what he's pushing us to think about is that we shouldn't feel so great about our moral choices and our religious choices and our, our character choices, right? We, should, we have to make choices, but we should feel the loss of the choice we can't make, right? Even if I affirm that I'm making the best choice I can, mo moral regret means I feel regret for the choice I can't make, even when I continue to affirm the choice I am making, right? So you know what? I'm going to choose my religion, but I regret that I also can't choose this, right? Because I know my religion doesn't encapsulate all truth, or I'm going to choose this denomination, or here's the moral choice I'm going to make in this dilemma, and I'm going to regret that I can't make the other moral choice as well, right? So this, of course, gets far more complicated when we move beyond individual choices into the realm of societal norms and laws, right? For example, when we vote for something, we often hurt one population while we help another. I might feel that, you know what, it's really wrong to tax the rich unfairly, right? You know, we worked really hard for our money um, and it's just really, it's really unfair to overly tax the rich. And so I'm going to vote that there's lower taxation for the wealthy, and, but I do regret, I do regret that that means we can't increase welfare, but I still think that morally it's right. Or the opposite. Say, so you know what? I think we should really heavily tax those who are in a higher socioeconomic status, um, you know, um, because that's going to, you know, help people to rise up through social mobility and fund many of our systems. But I really regret because I do think it is kind of unfair that someone has to pay, you know, 40, 40 percent or, or higher of their of their income. Um, I really think it's unfair while well, other people are paying virtually nothing towards taxation. That's fundamentally unfair, even though I'm still going to choose that, right? But most people don't think that way. They just think, oh, the way I'm voting is right. Like, it's just right, and the other way is wrong, right? There's no regret at all for the side I'm not voting for, only, uh, only an affirmation that I'm on the, I'm on the right team. Um, or someone might say, you know what? I'm going to vote that more immigrants should be allowed in the country. You know, you know uh, uh, undocumented immigrants, say, you know, someone might be a fundamentalist and say, oh, that's only good and the other side's evil, right? Or they might say, you know what, that's what I'm going to vote for because I think there's human dignity to, to immigrants, even if they come illegally, right? But I really regret that all those people who are waiting in a legal process, that they're going to be held back because we're letting undocumented people come in. And all those people, hundreds of thousands of people who've been waiting in line for decades to come in the country, they can't come in. And I regret that. And so I regret my own choice I'm making even while I continue to make it. And so on and so on. We can go on and on. But people aren't thinking this way. We aren't thinking about regretting the choices we're making even when we make the right choice. Berlin wants us to feel the loss. Yes, there's a pluralism. There's multiple truths. But even while there's multiple truths, I need to make a choice. In 1969, Berlin publishes his most important work in four essays on liberty. 
which explored the tension between freedom and equality. While Hegel and Marx believed in a single spirit or force moving history, suggesting there was a kind of determinism behind human progression, Berlin's view was not so simple, as he believed many complicated factors influenced societal change historically. And just as he wanted to complicate our understanding of history, Berlin sought to complicate our understanding of moral life. Here he rejects singular principles, such as utilitarianism and Kant's categorical imperative, and suggests rather that there are many human values to juggle and hold together. Often those values are conflicting, and what becomes essential is learning how to navigate this tension without allowing things to descend into violence, right? So just to flesh it out a little, when we're talking about the Greeks and, 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 and virtue ethics, we spent a number of sessions on that. We're talking about Kant, his univer universal imper categorical imperative. We're dealing with all the utilitarians we talked about. They had kind of one singular way of viewing moral life, right? And Berlin's, and I love this image here, um, Berlin thinks of it as like juggling. There's no one moral theory. There's no one moral code. There's many moral values you're juggling at all times. And we need to figure out how to balance all of those. Now, that might sound like it's weakening moral moral, moral life, right? Oh, I can just kind of throw this ball up and catch that ball. I can kind of play around with it, right? But actually, it's much more robust, right? Because we got to keep all those balls in the air, right? Think about the me doubt for a moment in Musar. It's one thing to be like, you know what? I'm going to be patient. I'm all about patience. Or I am going to fill my life with gratitude. It's all about gratitude. It's another thing to say, you know what? I've got a few dozen virtues I'm juggling at once. I need to learn how to not only be softer and kinder, but also more courageous and bold. How am I going to live those two together? I need to figure out how to be slow to anger, but also have zrizu to be quick to act. So how am I going to be quick, but also slow? How am I going to be bold, but also, but also gentle? How am I going to be, how am I going to, um, how am I going to awaken a, a, um, a, like a, a fierce, uh, 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 a fierce, robust, strong commitment, but also carry more humility, right? And so it, it raises the bar to have to juggle many things at once. You know, I know people who have think there's a unified theory to life, like just be kind, just be nice, or just blah, 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 right? It, it sounds like a, a fun way to live, but uh, Berlin wants to raise the bar and say, uh-uh, like you got to do a lot of things. You got to be a lot of things. And, and, and to keep all those values up in the air at once, think about how simplistically some people talk about the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. Some people are like, war is horrible. Pacifism, cease fire now, right? It just, it doesn't matter any of the details. What only thing that matters is anti-war, right? And then the other side, uh, kind of a hawkish side. It doesn't matter any of the details, just, you know, bomb whatever you want, right? There's no attempt to, to juggle multiple values in how you think about conflicts. The capacity of Berlin's thought to uphold the value of all people made him a crucial thinker during the challenges of the 20th century. In 1992, Berlin told a humorous story on British radio about the time during World War II, Winston Churchill believed he'd invited Isaiah Berlin to lunch, but had mistakenly invited Irving Berlin, the Jewish American songwriter. <laughs> Um, true story, <laughs> invited Irving Berlin. <laughs> um, so thinking he was speaking to the philosopher, Churchill said, Mr. Berlin, Berlin, what is the most important piece of work you have ever done for us lately in your opinion? Irving Berlin's answer, I don't know. It should be a white Christmas, I guess. <laughs> so, uh, so even Winston Churchill uh, made such a mistake. You can find that uh, if you want to read more about that. Um, I can send you the I can send you the link, but um, it, it's I mean I, I can't imagine in today's world that such such uh, mistakes could be possible. But it is also great how many Jews wrote amazing Christian music. You know I don't know if it's still true, but I think the majority of Christian music we think of famous is actually has Jewish songwriters. Uh, so we should all enjoy it. You know maybe it doesn't have to start in August in all the stores. You know maybe October is good. But, um, in any case, Churchill continued to ask him questions not realizing who he was talking to, and eventually asked him when he thought the war might end. In response, Irving Berlin told Churchill, Sir, I shall never forget this moment 
when I go back to my country, I shall tell my children and my children's children that in the spring of 1944, the Prime Minister of Great Britain asked me when the European war was going to end. <laughs> this comical story illustrates the extent to which Isaiah Berlin was viewed as an influential thinker by one of the most significant world leaders at the time. For our lives as Jews, perhaps Berlin's biggest contribution is his insistence on pluralism. Though pluralism is relatively new to philosophy, we can find its roots far back in the history of the tradition. We read of a debate in the Talmud. Rabbi Abba said that Shmuel said, good old Shmuli, for three years, Beit Shammai and Beit Hillel disagreed. He said, the halakha is in accordance with our opinion. And these said, the halakha, meaning Jewish law, is in accordance with our opinion. Ultimately, a batzko, a divine voice, emerged and proclaimed, Elu ve'elu divre Elohim chayim. Both these words and those words are of the living God. However, the halakha is in accordance with the opinion of Beit Hillel. So even if God declares that the Jewish law is in accordance with the rulings of Beit Hillel, God also makes clear that the rulings of Beit Shammai are also to be, to be considered as part of the word of God. Multiple truths, and yet one side has to win, even if Beit Hillel is correct. There is a spark of truth in the position of Beit Shammai. The notion here is that there can be moral pluralism given the complexity of human intentions and human understanding. We know there are many noble pursuits that are good and conflicting in all of our lives. We are often weighing not the good versus the bad, but the good versus the good. Another example of pluralism comes in Pirkei Avot, in which we read the saying from Hillel, do not separate yourself from the community. Do not trust in yourself until the day of your death. Do not judge your fellow until you have reached their place. Perhaps there's a reason why these seemingly discontinuous statements are joined together. We cannot separate ourselves from the community because we need to rely on others. And even if we think others are not sufficiently upstanding, we are rarely in a position to judge them and act as if we, we have a right to impose our will upon them. Further in Pirkei Avot, one of my favorites, Ben Zoma says, who is wise? one who learns from every person. As it is stated, from all who taught me have I gained understanding. It's such, a, it's such a brilliant teaching because you might have said who is wise, one who has a PhD or one who's an MD or one who finished the Talmud or one who, you know, meditates five hours a day, a million of, of things that are just about the person. But what makes one wise is not what they contain within their heart or mind. What makes one wise is how they relate to others, how they view each moment as a moment of learning. The very fact that one can and must learn from all people means that their opinions and values have validity, even if they differ from our own. Furthermore, the Talmud says that, one, that the Torah one should learn is the Torah that one's heart is most pulled towards. Each of us must follow our own religious and moral passions, even if they differ from one another. This too is a pedagogical pluralism that each of us need to engage in spiritual practices and learning that uniquely fills us up. We should not just pour the same content into our students and children, but rather empower them to think creatively and follow their unique interests as well. So friends, to conclude, in the Jewish tradition, we see the value of pluralism. And we recognize that none of us have a monopoly on the truth. Not only this, but we can even find pluralism within ourselves, which often contain multiplicity and paradox within ourselves, the pluralism within the values of, that we hold. Yes, a key purpose of spiritual work is to create unity within the self, focus, determination, but that requires raising the sparks of the multitudes we contain. And it is no different with the multiplicity within our families, in our communities, and in the world. Okay, dear friends, I'm going to pause there. And I'd love to open up our conversation together. Hey, Gary Gutsman. Hey, good morning. I think this, this VBM course is uh, 
Berlin to the max. I mean, what we're <laughs> teaching is, you know, Hegel is better than Buber. This is like, or pick one. This is like, whoa, there, there are a lot of things going going on here. So uh, this has been fascinating. I'm glad I could make this one. I've been traveling. So hi, everyone. But I, I think uh, what a concern with this is uh, the blurring of uh, moral pluralism and moral relativism. Mm -hmm. And I think that's where I, I see uh, people get, in my view, get into, get into trouble that, uh, I think it's, I think it takes, like you, you said, it takes great, uh, intellectual and moral strength to hold all these competing balls in the air. Love that. Yes. Thank you so much. Um, I think that's exactly right. And just to flesh that out a little bit, a hundred, a hundred percent of you voted for pluralism over, over moral relativism in the beginning of our session that the relativism would say that basically nothing is true. Um, we don't have access to any truth. And um, and so, you know, doing X is equal to Y morally because we don't really know what's morally true. And that leads to a whole bunch of very dangerous pathways, potentially. Of course, we all embrace some level of relativity, relativism, but extreme moral relativism we know is very dangerous. <clears throat> Pluralism, on the other hand, right, on skepticism, that's the opposite. end. One end, relativism, nothing is true. The other end is pluralism, which says there's some level of truth to everything. Um, <clears throat> and the way that Yitz Greenberg has talked about it is to say that um, pluralism means not the abandonment of your moral absolutes, but the creating of space for others' moral absolutes while holding my moral absolutes. Right. Um, it doesn't mean the watering down of our absolutes, but I'm going to hold my absolute while I make space for yours. And um, so it'd be one thing to say, you know what? Judaism, Christianity, Buddhism, Islam, they're all true. It's all the same. Right. OK, that, that's one approach. Another is say, no, I think my religion is true and yours is not. But I create space for you and your religion um, be out of tolerance, out of respect. And out of a sense that I think you're trying to do something good, even though I think I've chosen my religion, not yours, because I think mine is true and yours is not true. So those are very different approaches to how one might embrace a type of, of, of pluralism. Yeah, I'd so, say good luck with that. Yeah, <laughs> uh, with, uh, with, uh, good luck with selling part? that. <laughs> What's that, Gary, with which part? I said good luck selling that, that uh, you know, people have the capacity to go, I believe what mine is true, but... It, and I don't believe yours, but I'm, it's okay. I'm, that, that's fine. We, we can all get, why don't we all get along? <laughs> right, right. You know, um, I mean, large, largely um, the type of religious pluralism we see in America is really a secularization. We basically say, oh, all religions can coexist because we're really not so interested in religion. Right. Once we say, oh, I'm really invested in my religion, it becomes much more difficult, as Gary's pointing out. It becomes much more difficult to actually say, like, I think you're wrong, but I really will fight for your space to practice that. Right. Um, and so, um, yes, anyways, a lot more to unpack there about how we can either have religious tolerance or religious pluralism or religious syncretism, the syncretism that kind of tries to blend them all. So anyways, Gary Gartsman, thanks for kicking us off so thoughtfully. Hi, Gary Friedlander. Good morning, everyone. Uh Actually, what you just said struck a chord with me. Uh, years ago, I was at a lecture by Rabbi Art Green. And you know, he mentioned uh, that uh, the reason that uh, multiple religions and cultures can't speak to each other, because we all speak a different religion, but ultimately it's all the same. So uh, American uh, and Native, Native Americans speak Native American when they come to their religious and cultural things, and Christians do their thing, and Jews do those things, and, uh, and we just don't under, want to understand, or we speak a totally different religion, but ultimately it's it's all the same. Mm -hmm. So uh, <laughs> I just found that 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 was interesting, similar to what what you just was just. Oh, so about. so what you, are you saying his was his point that. Uh, we have such different languages for these, and we're very divided among them. But underlying that is um, our our shared core beliefs. Yes, 
exactly. That, you know, there's only one God in the world and we communicate with that God with various languages, but our inability to, to translate from one language to another prevents us from, from really understanding each other and, uh, and, and working together. Okay, very interesting. So, um, I mean, one of the things that is amazing about Joseph, I know we're out of the Joseph chapters now, uh, parches now, but is his ability to speak multiple languages. By multiple languages, I don't mean he speaks, you know, Egyptian and Hebrew and Spanish and French. I mean, his ability to communicate to people within a way they understand. Um, that, 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 that appears over and over. And today... I think there's very few who can really speak to different cultures, to different religions within their own value system in a way that gives them credibility, in a way that the bridge building is not, I know nothing about you and you know nothing about me, but let's have dinner, right? It's actually, I know who you are and I know who you are and I know who you are. And when I talk to you, I'm speaking from that place of understanding. I think few have invested on that level to, to get there. Um, and I know people who are, are really good at that on one level, like people who do Jewish Hindu work and they can talk to Hindus in their own language and make Judaism accessible and Hinduism both ways. Or there's a great scholar of Judaism and Islam in LA who can, te- he writes books about Islam for Jews and writes book about books about Judaism for Muslims in ways that honor both of the ways they understand things. Um, but to extend that more broadly now. Um, I think what's interesting about Art Green is that he's a mystic. Uh, Art Green is a neo-Kabbalist. And mysticism embraces that there's ultimately one truth underlying all religions because it's about oneness. Once you move religion out of mysticism into rationalism, the other camp of religion, I think it's much harder to say we're all doing the same thing, right? Um, If you say oh, there's one God and there's one reality and everything else is basically an illusion, a part of that oneness, then yeah, we're all doing the same thing, really. We're just calling it different things in different languages. But if you say, if you take a, a, the approach of reason rather than mysticism, I think that religions become very, very different, very different values, very different approaches. And that's an interesting test for ourselves of how how similar we think religions are based upon our approach. There. So Gary, I don't know if you want to follow up on that point at all. No, I I, ha- I happen to agree, but that goes back, I think, to, uh, from a mystical uh, perspective, uh, which may be something that's much more hopeful <laughs> than, than than reality, yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, as <clears throat> as we see in today and 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 always. So uh, it's it's juggling those balls. Sometimes we don't want to see. Uh, we're so caught up in our own culture, our own world, in our own belief system. Uh, we don't want to believe. Uh, uh, and, and, and other people and, and what they do either. Great. Yeah. So, you know, and just, to, just because I know this is a, a point important to you, I'll, I'll take it w- one step further. Mm-hmm. Does the um, progressive voting um, young um, liberal reform Jewish woman in living in L.A. in the Pico Robertson neighborhood, <laughs> does she have a lot or very little in common with a, a Haredi ultra-Orthodox man in his 60s, living in Ramat Beit Shemesh, right? Just south of Tel Aviv and Jerusalem. You say, absolutely nothing. This one's politically conservative. This one's politically progressive. They, you know, they have totally different understandings of what religion is about. Um, they, you know, they live in a different in different countries. And these people could not be more different. Someone else might say, what do you mean? They're both Jews. They both believe in tikkun olam, repairing the world in this way or another. And actually, like they, 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 the, um, they, they have an enormous amount in common if they could only see it, right? Or so too, like you know, a conservative voting evangelical Christian or a reformed Jew in America, right? You might say, oh, nothing in common. Different religions, different politics, you know. But, and then you, but then you put them in the same room, you know, in in China, you know, mm-hmm. and then they try to, you know, they say, oh, I'm not, well, I'm not really Chinese. I don't really fit in here. And they start talking to each other. Are they going to find they have some things to talk about? You know. Or, or, you know, if in America, they're at polar opposite ends, but if you put them in a a restaurant in China, you know. So how different are we as humans? And some people are in the business of demonstrating we're really different. Right. That we're, um, and we're, and it's, it's, um, it's, it's unhealable. It's, 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 it's unresolvable. And others are in the business of trying to show our commonalities. And, um, 
it's something to think about, about, you know, how we how we think about difference today. Okay, Lauren Blatt, over to you. Thank you, Gary. It's something else I was going to say, but I just wanted to answer also about, say, uh, a reformed Jewish gal fairly assimilated in L.A. and an Orthodox person in Brooklyn, they're both going to get beat up by the anti-Semites right now. So the anti-Semites never let us forget that we're Jewish. I don't know what's happening in Phoenix. It ain't great here in Toronto. It's getting bad. Um, Chutz Mizrach, I was going to say, I was going to talk about like, okay, pluralism, a lot to say about it, but we've got two religions, Christianity and Islam, which are religions that proselytize, which refuse to accept the right of a Jew to be, to um, practice Judaism, of a Hindu to practice Hinduism, and Rabbi Sachs wrote about, a bit about that in one of his books. I think it was called Not In My Name about him. He was in an interference conference, and he and the Hindu person had a lot more in common because they didn't cross with sides. On the other side, we have, as soon as Reform Judaism took on not having a guest and recognizing patrilineal descent, they made it impossible for conservative and modern Orthodox and real Orthodox to marry among them because they just stepped over the line of this is our basic, this is what a Jew is, and they've got beyond it. And 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 I don't know how you how you deal with that problem. Great, great. Thank you for all of that, uh, Lauren. And <clears throat> You're absolutely right. I mean, that, you know, in, in a moment of war like this, there might be some unity, but at some point we'll get back to all of our bickering. Um, and a big part of that, uh, one of the 10 in, in the inside baseball, you know, polit politics of the Jewish community is the question of who is a Jew. And Reformed Jews might be very angry at Orthodox Jews, say, why don't you accept our conversions? Why don't you accept our marriages? This and, that. and Orthodox Jews might be mad saying, hey, you changed the rules, as you said. That it was it was naturally no descent, and only a few decades ago you made it naturally no descent. Um, and um, and there was an idea of a get, and you kind of changed kind of changed the rules. And so both are kind of upset with each other. Why don't you accept me? And hey, why did you change the rules? And um, I think there's very little pathway um, towards you know moving forward on that. You know, in, in, a, a, a guy who at Chabad, you know, shared recently with me that if somebody walks into a Chabad on campus and says, I'm a Jew, the assumption now is that they're actually not. Um, you don't you don't assume that they actually are, according to them, because um, they'll say, oh, it's very likely that they mean I'm a patrilineal uh, Jew um, or, or that they had a non-Orthodox conversion um, or the like. And that the majority of, you know, of these young people who will call themselves a Jew, according to them, will actually not even be a Jew. And um, so this is, um, of course, very alienating and hurtful for a young person who would, um, you know, be the recipient of, you know, of, of, of such a response. Um, and yet um, we have a real issue that we don't have any collective way of resolving these identity issues. Israel is trying desperately to remain, have centralized religion. We know that's not working out very well, um, but trying to uh, control those identity statuses so people don't question each other. They said, if we have one centralized way of identifying who's who, um, then um, th it, this won't be an issue. Um, of course, that's very <laughs> complicated as well. But, you know, to go back to this point of, of relativism, I think it's exactly right. I mean, it's one of the things we might, ask ourselves is why is it that we might be more tolerant uh, uh, religiously and less tolerant morally? Well, I'd say, oh, I'm really kind of a relativist when it comes to religion. You do yours, I do mine. It's all kind of true. It's all kind of not true. But morally, I'm going to have red lines. It used to be that these were kind of, you know, one and the same, right? That there were red lines on, on religion, red lines morally. And I think that people are much more likely to be pluralist on religion than they are on moral issues, you know, and that's worth us thinking about in our day, you know, what, you know, why that is. So Lauren, did you want to respond to any of that or? 
I, I was just thinking, I mean, uh, I know in Israel, uh, there's a very large problem with the number of um, non-Jewish Russians. And if only they would make it easier to convert, they make it hard to convert. Mm -hmm. But I think it should be the same thing with reformed Jews. And what you do about mums, Ruth, I don't know. That's a serious, serious problem. If you don't have a get and you have children with your second spouse and you're a female, the kids are mumsarim, generations they can't marry and I don't know how you get over that but you know with I, I know I spoke to conservative rabbis here in Toronto and right across the board the one thing that uh, conservative rabbis cannot do is recognize the patrilineal defense and they cannot do an intermarriage it would get them kicked out they, they would no longer be considered uh, a conservative rabbi and so the only thing I can see would be to make a not difficult conversion for the reformed Jew who isn't really Jewish. Um, but it's, it's, it's such a problem. And why they had to like completely throw out the baby with the bathwater. Okay, you don't keep Shabbos, you don't keep Shabbos. Doesn't hurt me. You don't keep Kashmir, it's fine. It doesn't hurt me. But you recognize patrilineal descent. My kid can't marry your kid. And you're taking yourself completely out of, of the Jewish people. And I think eventually it will just become um, kind of like Christianity. It will, it will be like no longer Jewish, but people who have some memory that somebody somewhere maybe was Jewish. But they don't. They don't remember. Thanks for they, they thanks for sharing, Lord. Yeah, I mean, okay. one of the vision, one of the visions I've had for a long time, uh, which I don't see actualizing, but has been to create an inter interdenominational baitin, an inter interdenominational court that would be able to do conversions that everyone would accept. Now, it would mean both sides would have to give up some things, which probably neither side is willing to. If the Orthodox were willing to say, you know, maybe the conversion candidate doesn't have to sign on to theological, you know, uh, commitment A, B, and C. Maybe they don't have to say they're 100% sure there's a God or they're 100% sure that God gave the Torah or they're 100% committed to observing all Jewish law. And maybe the reform side would have to be willing that the court was all men, right? That there were no women on the court. And I don't think either side is going to be willing to give up on either of those sides. Um, but if there was a way to create an interdenominational court going forward, you know, and maybe part of the commitment, as you're saying, is that, you know, patrilineal Jews could still be respected socially as Jews, but had to, you know, go through an, a reaffirmation, what one might call a conversion, a reaffirmation. And the Orthodox would have to be more lenient on who could have that. And the reform would have to be willing to say patrilineal is not all encompassing. It's only part of it. But again, um, I don't, I, you know, I don't see us moving in that way anytime soon. I think both sides think of each, uh, the other side as backwards and, you know, you know, irreparably destroying Judaism, unfortunately. So, all right, Cheryl, we're up to you, Cheryl. Okay, so um, I, I just have a couple things. Sometimes I uh, uh, regard myself as not, not being um, indecisive or wishy-washy, but thinking that, gee, there might be two sides. So you finally hit on the philosopher that rings so true with me because I tend to see so I tend to see two sides of of things. Well, it's you know, you know, especially I'm married to somebody who sees only one side. So that's, <laughs> that's uh, for those of you who know Stan. So anyway, um, that that really rang true with me. But I I, I also wonder about anti-Semitism and the Bill of Rights. And a, an, an, an alert just popped up on my um, phone, you know, the Arizona breaking news that comes, it's breaking news every 10 minutes, it seems. But this one was talking about the safe speech that faculty on, on the uh, university campuses have. I mean, if all of these things are in, in the, um, the, 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 the blood and bones of our country, and, but but yet all of these things are opposite of, you know, the free speech and all that kind of stuff. And then, I, I mean, it's very confusing to me how some things are written and are supposed to be a certain way. And yet 
no, nothing is. I mean, if if we're all supposed to say, well, yes, there's truth in your religion, but I think anti-Semitism goes beyond that because they're not regarding it as religion. I think it's something beyond that. Uh, it's, you know, it's really a, a lot of it. I, I would say, you know, a, a majority of it is because of lack of knowledge, you know, and just kind of jumping on a bandwagon. But I, I just am, sometimes I'm confounded by, these kinds of things and these approaches towards uh, things that we think should be verboten or they're, they're written into what we stand for as it, or we're supposed to stand for as a country. So that's what I was just wondering about. Awesome, Cheryl. So I'm curious if there's another example you might offer kind of where you're, 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 you're struggling as you're holding both sides right now. I mean, I, I, I think that, yeah, there's a lot of conversation now about free speech and safe speech and how that clashes with hate speech and, you know, the role of universities to have a place of mm -hmm. ideas where people can express themselves and organize themselves. And on the other hand, the role of universities to have some moral, you know, red lines on that. Um, so there's tons of talk oh, yes. there. I'm curious if there's another issue that you're kind of- Okay, with. yes. I, I can also talk about um, incarceration because I think a lot about that too. And I, but, but then again, that also goes with along, you know, especially racial lines. You know, you find that, you know, people who might be, in my opinion, um, wrongfully incarcerated for, let's say, a minor crime, it's because of who they are or what they look like, that kind of thing. I, and so yet, and then the other hand, I think, well, if somebody commits a crime, they should, you know, pay some sort of penalty for it. I mean, I, you know, there's a lot of things that I think about like that, where I'm, I'm, wa <laughs> I waffle on both sides. So right, yeah, that's another great example where I think many people feel conflicted around the need for law and order, and yet also a sense of, um, of how you know how 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 criminal justice is oftentimes carried out. Um, mm -hmm. So yeah, I appreciate I I you know I I, I appreciate that and I appreciate your your um your value in, in uh, of of Berlin's approach, which I think is very valuable. How we talk about ideas today, and I think you and Stan are a great a great uh, partners <laughs> in how you see it all a little differently. Hi, Sarah. Thanks, thanks, Cheryl. Want to jump in, Sarah? Sure. So, um, rather than waffling. I'd like to think of our holding the tension mm -hmm. and our finding our own spiritual connection through that tension rather than having to choose in that binary. Yeah, I, I, I'm reading a book right now by Peter Singer, who has me thinking a lot, and it's about our about altruism and essential altruism and the rational versus the emotional. And, and I'm sitting there going, well, what if I'm both? What, you know, and it's okay to be both of these things and to make some choices about how I share my wealth from my heart and some of it through that rational mind that says, this is where I can do the most good. So I think we're always, if we're not constantly in that debate, if we're not constantly in that tension, then where are we? Eh. Great, great. Thank you, Sarah. Um, how do we um, um, achieve what you're calling holding the tension? or what some might call balancing, or some might call harmonizing. Um, and yet, I think one of the difficulties is when it's when it's work of the heart, that's one thing. But it, it, when, it's, when it's in the practical realm where we have to act, how do we continue to hold the tension while we have to continue to walk at the same time? We have to continue to act in the world. How do we make a choice, even in, 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 in sometimes in even a binary fashion when we have to, while still holding that? And Sarah, I'm going to send it back to you in a moment. But I hope when we get to Peter Singer shortly, um, that you'll share a little bit about what you're reading about, because I think the conversations around altruism and philanthropy are really important um, as, we, as, as we move towards him. But Sarah, let, let me pass the ball back to you. Well, I, 
I've been thinking a lot about this group as I've been reading it. So um, it's been a delight. And it's what happens when I wake up at four in the morning and can't go back to sleep. It's like, oh, let's read some Peter Singer. Um, <laughs> but when I'm thinking about religion and all of the variety of religions, I'm wondering if one of the core pieces, whether whether it's acknowledged or not, is about our real longing to be connected to the infinite, to the divine, to whatever that is that is ineffable, and and whether uh, whether our fundamentalist Christian friends know that or not, I don't know. But I'm wondering if that's what holds us all together in our religious space. Very nice, thank you. Uh, uh, just before we move to Etiwata, you know, I fear on, um, you know, I mean, when we talk about values or religious truths, it might feel, um, you know, difficult when we talk about pluralism. But when we think about just human journeys and how many different pathways we're all on of where we've come from and where we've walked in the world and how different we are, you know, I, when I was speaking in a prison recently and I was talking about pluralism to about 100 inmates, um, you know, one of them said, makes no sense, Rabbi, what you're saying. One plus one is two, not three. And if you say one plus one is three, you're wrong, right? There are real truths and you can't blur, you know. And uh, and then another inmate rose his hand. He said, Rabbi, how many highways could you have taken to get to this, to get to this uh, prison? I said, well, I could have taken this. I could have gone this route. I could have taken a longer route, this route. Because that's the point, that there's one destination. There's multiple paths to ultimately get there, right? And um, and just looking at each other and, and being intrigued and curious about each other's journeys and how different our life journeys are. We often assume people have been on the same path we've been on, had the same education, the same positive experience, the same negative ones. We are so different in our journeys. And... Um, if we can't get the pluralism on religious truths and on moral values, maybe we can get there on just, uh, you know, on, on understanding the multiplicity of uh, of human experiences that, that exist. So, Ed, over to you. Uh, I don't even know where to start here. <laughs> uh, the issue, though, of um, dualism versus plurality is, I guess, where I'm having a bit of problem. Um, duality implies that there are two. Uh, plurality, I would say most would define as more than one, and now I'm having to say it's more than two. Um, because every time I hear this duality, I think it's a false dilemma. Uh, there are more than just two balls in the air. Um, so the other part that I wanted to mention um, and, and, and this is just my um, definition, um, is that all of these topics of the philosophers are basically a choice of a, you know, dualism, but they're looking for, I think, the truth. And, and I mean, the, the level where I define as being beyond human comprehension but we're all striving for it. And then at the other end of the spectrum is the individual, as Berlin would say, who has to deal with trying to find their truth, which may not be the truth at that level, but based on their experience, their knowledge, their learned whatever, uh, they believe that they have some truth. Now, I see the problem is that they say that they found it from a group that is a religion, politics, mm -hmm. social norms, whatever. Mm -hmm. But those groups are made up of individuals who may have differing mm -hmm. truths. They might have some that are overlapping. I believe in God. Okay, well, you belong to the Christians. Yeah, but they're supposed to be, you know, anti-abortion or for life and 
so I, and so you have the subgroups that have their own sub truths, all of them may be contending that they know the truth. Mm -hmm. And you end up in a bit of a conflict or war, killing, mm -hmm. where the only solution for most is to say, I've got to exterminate those that believe otherwise, as opposed to saying, you know, let's get together and talk about this. Um, if you truly believe that you have the truth, the group particularly, and have the power to enforce it, i.e. the emperor that says, you know, Christianity is going to be the religion of the empire. And if you don't convert, we're going to eliminate you, exterminate you. So I'm also a little bit pessimistic at this religion level, group level, political level. You know, you're either a Democrat or a Republican, and there's nothing in between. The real problem is, is that I don't know what my truth is then, because I can hear all these sides but I now have to figure out what is my truth before I could even begin to think about which group should I join or should I even join one? Yes. And, and that's so well said. Ed, and that's exactly where Berlin challenges us because he says, oh, don't yeah. just do the work of negative liberty where you say, oh, I'm a pluralist. Like I'm, I'm against people being persecuted based on their beliefs. There's no, you have to do the work of positive liberty and say, what are you free to pursue in your life? What are you pursuing as the good ends of your life, right? And each of us, as you said, there's not a truth for that. Each of us has to find our own truth to that. And that's why you can't have a communist society where we just impose the good life upon the masses. Everyone is free to, and then morally charged to go figure out what the good life is. And, um, and it's not enough to say, you're right, I'm, a, I'm in this political party or I'm in this, I'm in this religion. And so... That's a great place to pause. And thanks for moving us in that direction for us to think about how are we making sure that people are free from um, from oppression where they can't live their lives in the fullest. And yet, how do we go even a step further and make sure we're, we're in addition to, to creating free spaces, that we are ourselves doing the work to choose the good, even if it's the good we're not going to impose upon others. Have a wonderful day, everyone. Thanks for joining Berlin. Can't wait to thanks. see you next week.